Hey there, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government ad series. As you know, our co-founder in chief has finally announced the date of the election. For the past three years, we've been making Honest Government ads, tracking this government's bullshit, scams, rorts, climate inaction, and miscellaneous bastardry. So by now, you know the reasons why the coalition needs to be voted out at this election. But if you needed one more excellent reason to convince your conservative voting friend or family member to put the coalition last on the ballot, you'll find it in today's podcast, which is the companion to our latest Honest Government ad about the coalition's massive carbon credits and offsetting scam. I mean scheme. You know how when you book a flight, you can pay a little extra money to offset your emissions? Well, now imagine that your money was actually being spent on strippers and coke. Except the strippers are our mates and the coke is gas. Congratulations. You're ready to learn about our Australian carbon credit units. Let's take a look. Whoever wins the election in May, carbon credits and offsetting will continue to be a crucial issue. And that's because both major parties running in this election are leaning heavily on carbon credits and offsetting in order to achieve their net zero targets. Not just here in Australia, but worldwide, as most wealthy nations are opting to offset emissions rather than ending fossil fuel burning, which of course is what we should be doing. However, we can't just bin the whole idea because there are some areas where we currently have no easy alternative to avoid emitting greenhouse gases. And that is why we actually need carbon credits and offsetting schemes that work. But they need to be genuine offsets, not offsets. Unfortunately, most people don't understand how carbon markets and offsets work, let alone the way they've been rorted by the coalition and how they're actually contributing to rising emissions, which is why I've dedicated this Honest Government ad to this topic on the eve of the election. And to help us unpack our latest Honest Government ad and better understand carbon credits and offsets, I have as my guest today an expert on the topic, Polly Hemming. A researcher and advisor in the Climate and Energy Program at the Australia Institute, Polly's work focuses on the involvement of the fossil fuel industry in carbon markets. I hope you enjoy our chat and I'll catch you on the other side. Welcome to the Juice Media Podcast, Polly Hemming. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. I, I follow a lot of your work on, on Twitter. You've, you've, you're one of the people that's really helping to inform um, you know, the, the the community here in Australia, and I'm sure also overseas about what's happening with uh, all of this really quite technical and complicated stuff uh, around carbon credits and offsets and, and, and other stuff. And we're going to get geeky with you about carbon credits and offsets in this podcast. But to lead us into that, uh, I want to ask you about the coming election. By now, everyone will know that our coal fondler in chief has announced the election for the 21st of May. And I want to know from a climate and energy policy perspective, how do you see this election shaping up? Who are the main contenders and where do you see any solutions, if any, lying? The, the way I see it as a voter is we've got um, the incumbent, we've got the coalition who, as you just described, the coal fondler in chief, um, who's accompanied by, I guess, a, an array of coal fondlers. But the, the coalition, the Liberal National Party, have a target, a climate target of 26 to 28% reduction um, by 2030 on 2005 levels, which is just inadequate any way you look at it. I think it represents something like three degrees of warming. There's um, it, both material support and continued advocacy for gas and coal through to 2050 and beyond. That's actually one of the lines in the net zero uh, plan. The Australian government currently has no credible emissions reduction policies. They do have this one climate policy that we will talk about today called the Emissions Reduction Fund. But beyond that, there's, there's nothing else, really. I think it's a complete absence. Everything you see in the net zero plan is things like carbon capture and storage or blue hydrogen, which is, to be clear, fossil hydrogen. So it's just backing in more fossil fuel use. But why are you uh, so negative, Polly? It's positive energy. Yeah. Positive energy. <laughs> Haven't you seen the ads? Come on. Come on. Well, we're going to, we're going to get on, 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 onto the ad campaign, but what are the alternatives? A lot of people post in our comments and go, tell us, you know, who do we, who do we vote for? Is Labor just as bad? Do they have a credible alternative to this? How do you see the opposition, uh, opposition's climate policy heading into the election? Sure. Yeah, it occurred to me as I was saying that I was telling you probably everything um, that people already know. It's good to remind Labor people. <laughs> Labor has a climate plan, which is a 43% reduction, uh, which is not as strong as their previous target that they took to the last election, uh, but it's significantly better than the coalition's climate target. They also have a really strong renewables plan. 
Um, so active investment in renewables uh, and investment in R&D and, and hard to abate sectors, which we'll probably talk about today, like steel um, and, and metals manufacturing and things like that. They are probably, we're talking about offsets today, they are also relying on carbon credits as part of their plan. I should have mentioned that um, in terms of the coalition as well, but the Emissions Reduction Fund isn't there only climate policy. So they're better, but they're still not aligned with what the science says we need to do. Um, I would say that, that Labor is also, I mean, they've made no commitments to phasing out gas or coal. Uh, like the coalition, they, uh, they receive significant donations from the fossil fuel industry. Putting those two aside, you've also got, obviously, the Greens as a contender and What's really exciting is you've got this vast array of independent candidates who have cropped up all over the place who have significantly more ambitious climate policies than I would say either of the major parties. As, as we've spoken about, the coalition is spending millions of, uh, of dollars on this ad campaign, Positive Energy. Um, but as we've shown in a lot of our honest government ads over the past year, a lot of this, this, um, this Positive Energy campaign um, is massively uh, deceptive in the sense that it's, you know, they're still going to plan to expand fossil fuels, mm. but they're trying to dress it up as climate action with bullshit solutions like carbon capture and storage, clean hydrogen, and of course, carbon credits and offsets, which mm. we're talking about today. And as you mentioned, the Labour Party has a more ambitious target, but precisely because it is more ambitious, they're going to be relying on offsetting even more. Um, and especially because the Labour Party is also planning to expand fossil fuel production. So they'll be trying to offshoot offset the shit out of these those right, emissions yeah. with carbon credits. <laughs> offshit is another way we could have, uh, yeah, fuck offsets and offshits. Why didn't I think of that? Um, so is it fair to say, Polly, that regardless of who wins this election, carbon credits and offsets will uh, be absolutely central to climate policy in the years to come? Yeah, carbon credits and carbon offsetting, and there and there is a distinction we can talk about, are, going, are central really to, to either of these parties' climate policies, as you said. And that's why it's it's really important that, that these carbon credits have integrity and that there's also some guidelines about how they're used. So currently, and the risk is that they will be used as a licence to pollute. It's actually not what they're for. Um, they're, they're really for those genuine, they have a narrow application, which is for those genuinely hard to abate sectors. But yeah, to answer your question directly, they're, they're probably critical to both parties' plans. Right. So it, let's just assume that Labor wins the selection and they form a, a form government. What, what would a Labor government need to do about the shit buffet? The shit buffet is this collective term for the clean energy regulator slash uh, assurance committee slash the uh, um, emissions reduction fund. What would they need to do to fix it to ensure that we don't get fed the shit buffet for another three years? What would you like to see them do? I think the, the very first thing, which is what they've committed to, is doing a review of the shit buffet. Um, of, well, they've committed to a review of the Emissions Reduction Fund. I don't know how far that extends in terms of governance, but, it, you know, it, there's there's more than just the fact that these credits, as, as your ad suggests, are not um, real or additional, but the governance of them has, is, has significant problems as well. So really, I if it was me suggesting a review, I would say, A, an inquiry into how we got here, how this happened. You know, we had this um, fund nominally called the Emissions Reduction Fund that is now somehow facilitating emissions increases. So something happened along the way there for that to happen. A an inquiry into that um, and then a review of all these major methods, you, particularly those three major ones, um, that are issuing credits and that are being used to offset emissions, you know, are, should they still be used by the Emissions Reduction Fund and how can we make this system better so these carbon credits do have integrity and they're used with integrity? Okay, so at this point, a lot of people um, would be going, hang on, I'm confused. What are we, what the f are we talking about here? Because one of the real challenges with this, with this, with this issue is that it, it actually is complicated and it's messy and there are all these different moving parts. You've got the Emissions Reduction Fund, you've got the Clean Energy Regulator, you've got the Assurance Committee, there are different methods. Um, mm -hmm. It's complicated stuff. And this is I, honestly, probably very simply, one of the reasons that we have the situation is that people just 
don't are not equipped with the literacy that's required to really understand the scale of the rot uh, of, of of public funds, um, and on top of that, how this isn't even going to reduce emissions. So there's a double um, you here um, in, in buried in in in, in the situation. So talk us through it, uh, Polly. Uh, let's get geeky. Carbon credits and offsets. What are they? Um, and Perhaps, you know, the situation that you've mentioned now, we've recently had Professor Andrew McIntosh from the ANU who has come forward and blown the whistle saying um, the, offsetting, the offsetting scheme is a rot. He's been central to designing the, and, and being part of implementing these, these things. So he's a very credible um, uh, source. What is going on here? What are the ways in which our carbon credits have been failing to actually abate emissions? Sure. So I'll, I'll start right from the beginning, if you want, just explaining what yes. carbon credits are um, in Australia. I kind of wish I had a whiteboard to explain all this. I might just gesture wildly at you. So if I start from the Emissions Reduction Fund, right, it's, it's this scheme plus a bucket of money, um, and there's a bit of history to it, but um, which I can go into as well. But basically now, in its current iteration, it's a scheme that issues carbon credits or ACUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units, to projects who carry out various activities across the economy that reduce or avoid or store carbon or CO2, sorry, not carbon, um, or, or other greenhouse gases. And it's things like um, you've addressed some of them in, the, in your ad, like uh, retaining vegetation instead of clearing it or planting trees or capturing methane from landfill gas facilities uh, instead of it being vented into the atmosphere. And for each tonne of CO2 that you store or avoid, you get given an ACU, a carbon credit, and you can either then sell that, <laughs> sell that carbon credit back to the government as the ad says, and the government uses taxpayer money from the Emissions Reduction Fund, it's this $4.5 billion bucket of money, sell it back to the government, or you can sell that credit uh, on what we call the voluntary market, which is to businesses who want to offset their emissions. So when you produce the carbon credit, it's just a carbon credit, right? It represents one tonne of CO2 reduction. When a business buys it and then uses it to compensate for releasing a ton of CO into the atmosphere, that's when it becomes an offset. Uh, so that's right. the that's the clarification between carbon credits and carbon offsets. And, and currently Well, I was just going to say just to yeah. clarify for people that, you know, when we see the government saying we've we've got a plan for net zero by 2050 mm. or by 2030 mm. or whatever, that plan, that reduction of emissions relies on the systems that you, you're going to talk about now working. Mm. What are the ways in which is, these credits are, are supposed to work? And what does Andrew McIntosh reveal? What is he actually brought out into the open about what's not happening? What it means when they're real is that the carbon's actually been stored or avoided. That's number one. There's this really important concept too called additionality. So the whole point of the Emissions Reduction Fund was to incentivize um, these activities that were additional to business as usual. So to try and get farmers to plant more trees than they were going to or not cut down trees that they weren't going to um, otherwise, sorry, yeah. thinking in that counterfactual. What Professor McIntosh found, and the Australia Institute has written a report about this too, is that a majority of these carbon credits are either not real or not additional, or in some cases, both. Um, so there's three main ways currently that people can generate carbon credits in Australia that are being um, sold back to the government as you, and used as offsets. Um, and Professor, Professor McIntosh kind of assessed these three biggest, um, we call them methods, these activities, assessed these three biggest methods and found that they weren't resulting in real abatement or it was an additional abatement. So I'm sure people listening by now will be wondering, is it a mistake that our carbon credits and offsets are being run so poorly? Or is it by design? Is the shit buffet actually meant to be shit and it's working exactly as intended? Where, where are we with that? And if it is working as intended, why is it being run this way? Who benefits from our carbon credits being dodgy and how do they benefit? Yeah, the buffet, as you call it, is working the way it's meant to under the current government. Um, doesn't mean it's working for climate or for taxpayers, um, but the, the, it is, I would say, largely by design. And, and I guess by that, I mean that 
carbon credits are being used cosmetically at least to bridge the gap, sorry, between kind of two fundamentally contradictory ideas. So a push for gas expansion in Australia and you know, support for the fossil fuel industry and a net zero commitment or emissions reduction commitment. So it, the best way that you can kind of bridge that gap is if you increase the supply of carbon credits that are available to the fossil fuel companies and, and what happens when you increase the supply of something, the price drops, um, right. also good for fossil fuel companies. Um, and one way, it's not the only way of making something cheaper is to reduce the quality of something. So the issues that were raised over a number of years that, that weren't picked up, you know, potentially fairly innocently um, has actually served the government fairly well now because it has maintained this large supply of carbon credits. Um, so the result or the aim of the buffets not actually to have a high quality product, it's to allow the gas industry and, and other big emitters to be seen to be offsetting their emissions on paper. So yeah, in that sense, the system's working, uh, probably just not as you or I or, or many others would like it to. So, you know, when people go to book a flight and there's that little box that says, do you want to offset your emissions? How do people know, you know, it, it, how do you know whether that's actually going to offset? I mean, we've, we've talked about dodgy carbon credits, but that's within the government scheme. Does that mean that all offsets that airlines are, are, are selling for, to offset emissions are also in that same bag? Or is that, is that a safe way to actually, you can actually um, be confident in those in those offsetting schemes? Yeah, that is a, a brilliant question. And you've just highlighted the, the fundamental issue here in Australia and globally, right? Um, carbon credits are financial instruments, which means you should have some assurance that someone has certified them and said, this is legit. We have all these different frameworks, whether it's, you know, a government administered frameworks like we have in Australia or overseas, you have these voluntary carbon credit frameworks, but either way, you have these frameworks that are, should be doing due diligence um, and ensuring integrity, and they should be checking out all these projects, checking whether they're, they're even legal, you know, they've been set up in developing countries with consent, um, and they're actually representing real reductions. Unfortunately, I don't know of any carbon credit framework around the world that I could 100% say, yes, these credits represent something real. So I'm not telling people what to do because they are financial instruments. I can't give you financial advice. But if if you really wanted to go that extra step and see whether your money was being spent wisely, look at what the actual project is. Um, depends how committed you are, you could probably look up that project yourself. You should be able to rely on the fact that it's been verified by some external certifier or auditor this is what we're finding out. It's it's genuine, generally not the case. Um, and yeah, you, there's there's ways of telling which projects are additional and real or not. Um, but but I guess furthermore, business it would be far more efficient for businesses to actually lobby government or advocate for clean energy in Australia than it would be for them to kind of go through these really complex processes where they're purchasing carbon credits on behalf of customers, potentially being pinged for greenwashing, you know, you'd get much more bang for your buck time-wise and financially if, if there was this push saying to government, we're finding it really hard to decarbonise, we're having to rely on offsets, uh, what are you going to do about it? Because it's making us look bad. That I really don't understand why more of that doesn't happen. More bang for your buck and also the bonus added feature of not killing the planet and every, every living thing that, that's on yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, sure, you know, whatever, if that's important you know, to yeah. you. But, but yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah, right. why aren't businesses shouting as loudly as, mm. as fossil fuel companies are? Yeah. So, I mean, hearing this, it sounds like, and I think everyone would really go, well, a system like this really hinges on one key fundamental thing, and that is trust. Like mm. it, the, you, you, there has to be, uh, uh, you have to trust that people are actually doing the work. And I, I want to say that, you know, there, are, there obviously are a lot of landholders and businesses who are uh, it, doing the right thing. It's not, uh, you know, as Andrew McIntosh came out saying, you know, 70 to 80% of those accus are, um, um, are not abating anything, but that, you know, there's 20 or 30% that are. So 
one of the really painful things is that the people who are doing the right thing are being fucked over as well by this whole system. So this is a really big issue around carbon credit. So, you know, there's traditional owners and conservationists and landholders who are relying on this system to, to make a living. And, and I used to live in Arnhem Land and I've worked for um, an Indigenous ranger group and, and I have some idea of how important, you know, savannah burning projects or carbon credit projects can be. But if the product on which this entire market is based, um, i.e. those the carbon reduction from those credits is found to be not working, then that immediately jeopardises all these other good things that the production of that carbon um, reduction was resulting in. And I think that's that's something that that we just we need to acknowledge and potentially address in other ways, whether it's through environmental markets or different ways. But but a whole lot of people are being let down by this system, not just the people buying the dodgy credits or the taxpayer. Like there's there's collateral damage all throughout. What are some of the things? Uh, you know, we, we've mentioned some of the conflicts of interest that that um, that exist in the shit buffet. Um, but perhaps you could give us a, a clearer sense of you know, can we trust uh, this government to um, to be implementing this uh, the scheme? Uh, with integrity? Mm. I mean, what are the, some of the warning signs that, that you've seen that say that maybe we can't? Probably one of the biggest warning signs. Oh, God, where to begin? The f- <laughs> well, I'll that's just- it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've said it, basically, yeah. <laughs> I think you've got the Clean Energy Regulator, which is an independent statutory government body, and this body as the ad says, like designs carbon credit methods um, in conjunction with industry. So you already see the gas industry is kind of infiltrated there. And that was one of the recommendations of Grant King, that industry be more deeply involved with developing carbon credit methods. Grant uh, King is the former CEO of Origin, oh, who is former also- boss of Origin, who's awesome. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, he is now chair of the Climate Change Authority. So the CER develops methods in conjunction with industry. It then issues carbon credits to the active to the projects carrying out activities according to those methods, um, which is the rules basically. Uh, it regulates the people who are carrying out those activities, and then kind of the kicker is this body. All these functions used to be carried out separately by different organisations. The government has mandated the clean energy regulator to buy these carbon credits back on its behalf, but not just on its behalf, but at lowest cost. So you've got this whole kind of carbon credit factory where you are making the product that you are also going to be buying as cheaply as possible, uh, which, and and this goes back to transparency, you can't see anything that's happening within that that whole process like within the sausage factory you don't know what's going in um, and what's coming out and then on top of that like over here we've got this little peripheral also an independent statutory committee called the emissions reduction assurance committee and that is staffed by the clean energy regulator but what that committee is meant to do is assess a carbon credit method as in the rules for developing a certain um, type of carbon credit and then advise the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Ang- Reduction Angus Ta- Taylor. Sorry, I, you know who I'm talking about when I say Angus Taylor. Yep. Choke on the emissions reduction bit. They're the ones that advise Minister Taylor on whether that carbon credit method is legit or not. Like Angus, yes, developing carbon credits from CCS is a really great idea. It's fully legit here. Um, you should sign off on it so we can get Santos registered. So they're the ones providing that advice. In the current context, members of that Emissions Reduction Assurance Committee uh, also have industry interests. Like if we use the carbon capture and storage carbon credit method as an example, they also are involved in industry or uh, fossil fuel lobbyists who helped to design the carbon credit, the CCS carbon credit method that would benefit their industries. And then they also said, told the minister that this is a really cool carbon credit method and it's totally fine and there's nothing wrong with it and you should definitely approve it. So does that kind of paint a bit of a picture about yeah, so what's going on here? 
So um, again, um, uh, for, um, you know, Chris Bowen, uh, the Labour Party has said that if if elected, they will um, conduct a short, sharp review. That's how they've they discussed it. But it sounds uh, described it. But it sounds like what's needed is more than just short and sharp. It needs to be quite an in depth. So obviously, great that Labour has said they will review the system, but um, it will need to be seen whether some of the whether they it'll be. Uh, you know, a proper review that will actually deal with, with the problem or whether it's just, you know, shuffling the, the deck chairs and going, ta-da, you know, we've solved it, um, we've solved this problem. Because, and this is a, one point that I kind of want to leave off and I want to ask you one more question after this, but it's such a, an interesting tension because on the one hand, we know that carbon credits and offsets aren't the solution to the climate crisis. Stopping burning fossil fuels, that's that's the thing we really need to be working hard on. And, and um, offsetting is important for those sectors, as you said, that are hard to um, abate, like agriculture and steel and aviation. So we need to use those systems. So we can't just chuck, because it's easy to go, oh, well, this is a, this whole shit buffet shit, chuck it out, you know, we don't need it. But we actually need carbon credits and offsetting to work uh, as part of the transition towards eliminating fossil fuels. So there's this tension. Um, I don't know, can you comment on that? Because I, I see some people, sometimes people, um, confused like are we supposed to hate this or are we supposed to like it it's like one or both you can hate the system and also want it to work right isn't that is that an interesting kind of uh, to me it seems interesting that there's that tension there there is a tension there uh but i think you you nailed it early on if i mean if we phased out fossil fuels it, it's highly unlikely we'd be in this mess in the first place uh we'd be talking about a much smaller issue and the the system would be far less, um, I think, vulnerable to being rorted. So I think we absolutely do need activities that are designed to, um, to incentivize reducing emissions or storing emissions or avoiding emissions. Uh, it's with integrity, it's then who is able to use them. So they shouldn't be used by Woodside so it can start selling shipments of, of carbon neutral LNG it should be used by the industries, you know, if, that that genuinely have no other option. But either way, you know, even if these carbon credits are not being used as offsets by industry, uh, so much taxpayer money is being wasted if we're not carrying out carbon credit generating activities that are additional and real. You know, a billion dollars has been spent approximately on the on carbon credits. That the government's bought back so far that that are kind of worthless that's a lot of money that could have been spent on renewables so i'm deviating from the question but yeah it's it's vexed it's not one of those binary things where you can say they're shit or or they're not and and there's more billions in that fund right the emission reductions fund is like four and a half billion dollars so there's a lot more public funds at stake uh here mm. if if this um if the rot isn't fixed polly um one of the really disturbing things about um, carbon credits and this, you know, uh, uh, well, yeah, like <laughs> <Why not? laughs> uh, another really disturbing thing about car carbon credits, um, it's the way that carbon credits and offsets um, can be used as a way to further exploit countries in the global south. In the Honest Government ad, we mentioned carbon colonialism. This isn't mm. a clever joke. It's an actual thing that's happening. Could you mm. unpack that for us and talk about the IPCOS scheme, which we mentioned in the, in the Honest Government ad, which most people won't have heard about because there's almost nothing about it in our media. What's happening on that front and what are the implications for our neighbours in the Pacific region and I guess also in the global south generally? Okay, so... In the Australian government's net zero plan, uh, they have said that to get to net zero, Australia needs 94 million international carbon offsets um, to, to get to net zero. I'm not sure what Labor's stance is on that. They haven't made any comment, but I just want to hark back to a few years ago when Scott Morrison was in parliament doing a Borat impersonation. Do you remember this? Just refresh our memory. I, I vaguely. I, I don't want to, to do it myself. It. <laughs> but basically, he was saying, Labor reckons it's going to meet its climate targets by buying car like carbon offsets from a piggery in Kazakhstan. I don't even know if they sell carbon credits. But then he did like this horrible 
Borat impersonation. Can you do it? Can you do the voice? So I don't why, why do you want to drag me? Or maybe the... just get the clip. <laughs> I'll play the, cue the clip. The Borat tax, which will be put on by the Labor Party with carbon credits to Kazakhstan. And I know what, I know what Borat would think of the Labor's, Labor Party's policies on emissions reduction, Mr. Speaker. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> we've seen the clip now. So carry on. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, the the coalition has stepped right back from that and have said, "Oh no, actually, we do need international carbon credits." They're setting. They're doing this through setting up a scheme called the Indo Pacific Carbon Offset Scheme, which you mention in the ad. And what that is, it's a one way bilateral trading scheme where Australia buys carbon offsets. Um, and they will be used as offsets. That's why I use that term to try and meet Australia's international climate targets. And they've ad- identified two countries so far, um, Fiji and PNG, uh, and they've signed up. Potentially um, Timor Leste will be signing up as well. But this whole system uh, appears to be just a reiteration of the way that you know carbon trading between very wealthy and uh, developing economies or, or poorer countries has always kind of played out. Like there's been this d- dynamic in the past where rich countries have not wanted to stop emitting. So the solution has been we will just buy carbon offsets from developing countries who can sell them cheaper because they can make them cheaper um, in developing countries and they're dependent on the income from that. But what that allows us to do is not change any business practices. We just offset, throw a few bucks at the Pacific um, and and everyone's happy except the people, you know, in in the developing countries, really. So it's always been a fairly questionable practice despite the promises that people make, you know, um, that it increases everyone's climate ambition in in both countries, you know, wealthy countries and developing countries, and there's technology transfer to, ve- to developing countries like uh, that allows them to get off um, fossil fuels and, and transition to a clean economy. It's very rarely played out that way. And why now it's particularly problematic is because traditionally these developing countries didn't have climate targets to meet. So they could just sell as many offsets or carbon credits or emissions reductions as they wanted to, uh, now all signatories to the Paris Agreement, this overarching global climate agreement, every country has a climate target to meet. So a little country like PNG, who is highly dependent on fossil fuels, largely thanks to Australian companies and finance from the Australian government and, and has a like an expanding gas industry, has very limited means to reduce its own emissions to transition its economy, um, yet it's also having to meet its own climate targets. So it's it's a pretty exploitative relationship. Not only, sorry, did, did you want to say something? Well, no. Well, just just so that people follow here, because and, mm. you know, you mentioned that uh, for carbon credits to actually be offsetting, they need to be additional, mm. and of course, they mm. need to be real. But there's the other thing that that they need to do is that they you can't have double double counting. So mm. what yeah. you're describing is, is another potential flaw in in the architecture of the carbon credits is that if we if this transaction is happening, PNG if PNG starts to you know, grow a forest or do something that is a carbon abatement. If they've sold that to Australia as as to offset our emissions, they can't count that. Well, they shouldn't because if they do, then that's another rot of the system. But mm. they can't count that as an addition. Mm. So it's eating into the headroom mm. that that um, um, you know, so-called developing countries have, which is needed in order to improve the, the quality of life of people there. So. What what you're describing is is a system. If if I if I've if I've got this right, that in order for fossil fuel companies in the global north to continue emitting, and in order for us to maintain what what we've come to regard as essential to our quality of life, we are basically uh, paying uh, uh, countries that that are less industrially developed from being able to do that themselves. So in, in a sense, that it's that's an exploitative system. It's an it, it's not a it's not justice, you know, in terms of how to solve the, the climate crisis. We are once again shifting the burden onto um, the global south. Yeah, and I think to go back to that word disturbing, you know, the relationship with small island developing states is um, is 
particularly disturbing because you've got a country like PNG or other Pacific nations who have repeatedly asked Australia to stop producing and burning fossil fuels. And not only have we ignored them, we've, or Australian companies have ex just exported their operations and set up shop in these countries, PNG in particular, uh, ignored them, continued to produce on country there, and then said, hey, also, can we have your carbon credits too? So, uh, and, and has has Labor said anything about IPCOS? Is this something that they've commented at all? Is this something that they're planning to also push forward or have they not said anything? No, they haven't said anything, uh, but it, it would be great to know what their, right. what their position was there. I mean, there's the architecture that the coalition is setting up currently interact with the Paris Agreement and Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So if they set up that architecture now, there's no reason why an incoming government government couldn't just use it. So we're talking about something that's going to be uh, something really central to a lot of conversations about our part of the world, our role in in, in our neighbourhood, in our in our uh, local um, part of the world. Um, but um, I really want to make an honest government ad about uh, what we've you know what people have called carbon colonialism to really because this mm -hmm. is a whole other issue. So Polly, thanks for taking us on on that journey. We've gone deep into some of the, the shit fuckery with the, the carbon uh, credits and offsets. And it is a complicated and confusing topic. So if people are thinking I'm confused, so am I. It's, you know, it, that is part of the problem as, as we've discussed. So thanks for breaking it down for us. Is there anything that you want to say that, that we haven't covered? Yeah, I guess uh, I would just say that uh, carbon credits, offsets, they're not a license to pollute. You know, the first thing we should be doing and and grant king himself i think said this in the um afr recently is that you need to reduce emissions first so you need to get rid of all the low-hanging fruit so in australia that's fossil fuels uh, then you start to address systems like this so so many problems these issues would be solved if we weren't reliant on gas and coal um, and we had a we had a clean energy transition in australia where we do have where we do need carbon credits and offsets they have to have integrity as you mentioned they have to be real and additional and permanent um and they need to be used sparingly so i think that maybe that sums it up nicely you have to reduce the first at first uh, and then you use carbon credits with integrity that are real and additional okay and if you want that don't vote for this government just to make it absolutely <laughs> clear all right, thanks for summing it up, um, uh, Polly. And if Labor does win, again, we'll be watching very carefully to see what this review into the shit buffet is going to be, whether it's actually going to fix the problem, because otherwise we're going to have to make another honest government ad about the Labor Party, and we don't want to have to do that. So that's why we made it before the election. All right, thanks so much for joining us, Polly. <laughs> really appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for all your work that you do at the Australia Institute and helping to keep people informed about all this stuff. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Juice Media Podcast. If the coalition is voted out in May, this Honest Government ad might be the final instalment in our climate shitfuckery series for this government. In it, we've covered the key pillars propping up the coalition's climate and energy policy, their Kyoto carryover credits, EVs, FFS, carbon capture and storage, conflicts of interest at the CSIRO, clean hydrogen, COP26, net zero by 2050, and more. Of course, climate shit fuckery will continue, if not here, certainly around the world. So fear not, we'll continue making these honest government ads about climate and energy policy into the future. I want to thank our patrons who supported us in making these honest government ads, but also all of you for the awesome response you've shown to our climate series, which has made all the hard work worthwhile. Thanks to Ellen for helping to produce and edit the Juice Media podcast and as always thanks to our patrons who make the podcast and the Honest Government ads possible. In particular our patron producers who support us via our highest patron tier of $100 a month. Thank you. If you value our work you can help us to keep going by signing up to our patron at patreon.com forward slash the Juice Media. You've been listening to the Juice Media podcast with me Giordano. I'll catch you very soon for our next Honest Government ad and stay tuned for our season two finale as we approach this crucial federal election. Till then, take care.